Welcome to Oscar 5011. This is found on page 42 of the task guide. This is identical to task O, the Oscar-2022 for mission scanners. All that we've done is change the words mission scanner to mission pilot. Uh, don't ask me why. Why they just didn't give us Oscar 2022, I don't know. They decided to write a whole new one and all, if you look at them side by side, they're the same. So since my mind reading abilities aren't that good, don't ask me that. Bottom line, for those of you who already have Mission Scanner, uh, this will be a refresher for you. And hopefully I'll make it funny. Since I don't like reinventing the wheel, once again, I wish to introduce you to Lieutenant Colonel Wayne Denisick of the California Wing, who is going to explain to us what scanning, scanning patterns are and why they're important. We can barely hear that. Yep. Yeah, I was about to say the same thing, sir. We can barely hear him. I just realized I forgot to, t I forgot to do something. So let me do this uh, and reshare. And this time, punch the little buttons. And where are we here? And we're going to bring it right back to the beginning. Scanning techniques, citing characteristics there. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, term scanning and fixation. Those are important in uh, increasing your uh, capability to spot something. Talk about uh, how aircraft motion affects our scanning patterns. Uh, talk a little bit about your uh, visual system. And we're relying on the eyeballs there. There's fixation points and uh, scan lines. Uh, a term that uh, you will see again, uh, would be my guess, is called scanning range. So you want to uh, be able to define what that is. And then we'll talk about uh, some suggested uh, scanning patterns. A little bit about uh, atmospherics and lighting. And then uh, once we've talked about the mechanics, uh, we'll spend some time talking about uh, what, are you what are we really looking for? And in the case of a missing airplane, uh, you're not looking for a missing airplane at all. That, if that airplane crashed, it's not going to be, it's very unlikely for it to be intact. Uh, what you're looking for is evidence that an airplane was there at one time. Okay, so let's talk about uh, scanning patterns, and we'll start by defining what scanning is. As you can see there, scanning is a process of investigating, examining, or checking by systematic uh, search. We use uh, a combination they talk about systematic head movement. That's something that whoever put the briefing together picked up, but it's not in the standard CAP references for scanning. And in fact, uh, as you scan, it's a combination of head movement and eye movement. And uh, basically uh, what you want to do is look at a point, uh, fixate it on it uh, for a fraction of a second, and then move your eyes and your head to another point, fixate it, and uh, so forth. What you don't want to be doing is trying to be, have your eyeballs constantly moving because the uh, part of your eye that detects as the best visual acuity is the central part of your eye, the fovea, and that part does not respond well to motion. Uh, it responds very well and you have good acuity when you stop and look at something. But if your eyes are moving, your acuity drops off. And in fact, when your eyes are moving, uh, your visual acuity is best by the peripheral vision, that picks up movement. And that's why if you notice, if you're concentrating reading a book or something, and somebody walks into the room and they're behind you and, and almost out of your uh, view, and they walk by, if they walk by, your eye will pick up that uh, motion there. So uh, one of the things uh, that uh, happens if you're flying along and you're just looking out the window uh, at the open air, your eyes will naturally focus on a point about 30 feet in front of you. And uh, if they're focused on a point 30 feet in front of you, something that is a half mile away is not going to be in focus. And because it's not in focus, uh, you're less likely to be able to perceive it there. So uh, it's real important that uh, when you start scanning, that you pick an object 
uh, on the ground at the uh, scanning range uh, away from your airplane, about a half mile to a mile, depending on the terrain and the uh, search visibility, and, uh, and consciously focus your eyes on that, uh, on that point there. Uh, where your peripheral vision, uh, although your peripheral vision acuity is only about a tenth compared to your central uh, vision, where this, the peripheral vision comes in uh, advantageous is uh, detecting motion, like I talked about, and also that is where uh, you have the best acuity at night. So in low light conditions, your peripheral vision will actually be better uh, than your uh, central vision. In fact, you can see that if it's really dark outside and you, uh, you look at something and you stare right at it, uh, it's, a, it's a little pinpoint of light or a dimly lit object, that, that object may in fact completely disappear uh, from your view. But instead of looking directly at it, if you look offset uh, one way or another, up or down, or left or right, uh, that'll bring it back into, uh, into view. So here we're talking uh, about a circle uh, that is uh, 10 degrees in, uh, in diameter there. And a way you can estimate the 10 degrees, if you hold your, uh, hold your fist out at arm's length and look at your fist, your fist subtends about uh, 10 degrees. And what's kind of interesting, if you're a bigger person, you're going to have a longer uh, arm, and so that fist is going to uh, subtend the same 10 degrees as a smaller person would with a smaller uh, fist there. So it's a pretty, they found that's a pretty accurate way to estimate what uh, 10 degrees uh, is. You can use that for a couple of uh, reasons. Uh, one is to calibrate your eyes as to how large an area you should be scanning at any given time. Uh, and also you could calibrate your eyes as far as how far below the horizon you want to be going out when you scan. Obviously you don't want to be scanning all the way to the horizon because the horizon may be five, six, 10 miles away and you're not gonna see the kind of things we're looking for at that distance there. Uh, they do talk about dark uh, adaptation. To really have good night vision, uh, it takes about 30 minutes of uh, uh, non-exposure to bright light. So uh, if you're planning to fly at night and uh, hoping to maybe spot a, uh, uh, somebody with a strobe that uh, landed in the ocean, uh, then you'd want to dark adapt and make sure that you, uh, that you don't expose your uh, eyes to bright light. And if you do have to use some brighter light, a technique you can use is close one eye, uh, use the other eye for that brighter light for whatever task you might be doing. And then when that uh, light goes away, then you can open the other eye. At least you preserve your night vision in one of your uh, two eyes there. Because at night you're using your peripheral vision, which is a much wider angle, it doesn't take as many scans to cover a, uh, a certain area on, over the ground. Uh, you can cover that same area uh, almost just by looking casually in that area, as opposed to a, a very focused, well, a well-disciplined method like we would use during daylight. Okay, well, let's talk about uh, a couple of things here. The picture uh, there is depicting an airplane and it's flying out of the screen at you. That's the direction it's going. So it's flying straight at you. This line here is, is pure vertical. And then this is uh, your uh, scanning uh, angle. And basically uh, what we're looking for is for this angle, this angle here, which is your scanning angle, uh, is usually somewhere between about 10 and 20 degrees below the horizon. So that's where you can use uh, your fist. And basically if you take your fist out to the horizon and then go two fists down, that would be 20 degrees down, that would be as far as you would want to be looking. So you don't want to be wasting your time looking way off to the side of the airplane uh, when in fact you're not going to be able to see anything because of the, uh, the search visibility. So search visibility, that is going to be the farthest distance that you can expect to spot your target of interest uh, at the altitude that you're flying. And typically we fly a thousand feet above the ground and uh, at, uh, at the fact that you're in a moving airplane. So again, search visibility is the farthest distance that you could expect to see your whatever objective you're looking for at the search altitude you're at in a moving airplane. So what we do is we take our scanning range and we want our scanning range, this thing here, to be less than our search visibility. There's no point in scanning way out here 
because uh, you've already determined you can't see any far away. Uh, so our scanning range uh, is going to be somewhat, is going to be either equal to or less than our search visibility. For Civil Air Patrol, uh, kind of a going in value for that is a half mile. And we're talking about nautical miles. A nautical mile is 15% greater than a statute mile. So statute mile, as you know, is 5,280 feet. A nautical mile is 6,000 feet. So typically a half nautical mile would be 3,000 feet. So you're looking between right underneath the airplane as, as low as you can see and out to uh, 3,000 feet. The half mile, if you do the uh, geometry, that would make this, this scanning angle here 18 degrees. That's why we say 20 degrees. Let's, let's focus now on the right side of this uh, diagram. And uh, this is a depiction um, from the airplane uh, looking down and this would be looking down out of the left rear window of the airplane. So here's the airplane flying along like this. So if you're in that, uh, in that uh, seat and you're moving your head left and right like this, thinking that, you're going, that you are uh, searching directly uh, perpendicular to your flight path, directly outside the left side of the airplane, you're not really doing that. And the reason you're not is in the process of doing this scan and uh, fixating and then moving it and fixating, the airplane has moved. And so instead of looking at these three places over the ground, you're actually looking at these three places. Because now by the time your eyes get out here, instead of the airplane being there, the airplane is right here. So in order to compensate for that aircraft motion, uh, your scan pattern needs to be diagonally like this, towards the rear of the airplane, from the airplane towards the rear. And whether you start here, which would be your scanning range, right, and move in, or you start at the airplane and move out, really doesn't matter. Either one uh, will, uh, that, that will work for you. What that will do, though, is by scanning diagonally, uh, you, in fact, will be uh, scanning perpendicular to your air aircraft flight path. So another way to, to think about um, scanning range, uh, sometimes it's defined, um, if, this, if you took this line as the airplane is coming out of the page at you, it would be uh, forming a line over the ground uh, as, it, as, it, uh, as it hit the ground, and that would be your track. The scanning range would be another line parallel to the aircraft track at your scanning range distance away. So that's, that's another way to look at that. I think we we'll probably have a picture that uh, better shows that. Uh, important to note here, your scanning range has to always be by definition less than your search range. So on a day where it's real foggy and smoky, uh, maybe you can only see this far where my uh, cursor is. So what you would do is, in that case, you would bring your scanning range into that same distance because you'd be wasting your time looking through a bunch of smoke over here. And instead we concentrate on this part here. Okay, so we talked about uh, scanning, uh, moving your head, focusing on the ground, not focusing on 30 feet in front of you. Uh, fixating momentarily, not just, you don't wanna just have your eyes in constant uh, motion there. And uh, what we're trying to look for is something that's unnatural, something that just doesn't belong, just doesn't seem right. And so after a while uh, over flying, uh, when you're flying over terrain, you'll get a feel for what's normal, you know, where, uh, what looks normal, uh, what a stream might look like, uh, what the growth of the foliage is, and so forth. So when you see something that's abnormal, that's what's gonna key you to investigate uh, further there. And so we've got listed uh, some uh, uh, clues here to think, to think about in this bullet here. If you're in a forested area, you might see some broken branches on the top of a tree or top of a tree clipped. Uh, you could see a burn spot, that's pretty common, or an area that's discolored, or a gap, you know, you've got an area where the foliage is fairly uniform, and then there's one gap somewhere that uh, see it looks out of place. So uh, basically you're looking for something that just doesn't look right. That's, uh, that's gonna be with the key. And again, you're in, in the case of searching for a airplane, uh, you're not looking for an airplane with a fuselage and two wings and a tail and uh, landing gear. You're looking for parts of an airplane. So, uh, so again, the key is um, having a discipline of focus there. 
Uh, we're looking at a coverage of about 10 degrees. Uh, the reason this, uh, this looks funny here is with a, if, if our airplane is here at the bottom, the farther you go away from the airplane, the bigger the area is that that 10 degree circle is uh, going to make on the ground. So uh, you would want to spend more of your time looking farther from the airplane and less of your time looking closer because if you're closer to the airplane, you're more likely to see something than you are farther. It's farther away, it's smaller, so it's going to take more time to, to do that there. Within this 10 degrees, you might fixate here once, fixate there, fixate, fixate, something like that as you, uh, as you come in. Let me summarize that by saying that uh, the key to effective scanning is being methodical. So uh, if you're just out there and kind of lollygagging around and sightseeing and uh, checking out the waterfalls and uh, looking for uh, whales, uh, you're not going to be very effective. Uh, it's, a, it's a very disciplined thing. It's tiring. So uh, you, you don't want to go more than about 15 or 20 minutes without taking a break. So that's, that's important as well. When you, uh, uh, when you are to the point where you feel like you need a break, you know, tell your mission pilot, uh, and uh, you'll knock off the search, climb up to a, a higher altitude. Uh, everybody can chill out, uh, drink some water. You can work on your, uh, your mission log, up, uh, keep that up to date. And then once you're rested after about five minutes or so, uh, drop back down and uh, continue the uh, search. So uh, I'm gonna present uh, one technique that some people have found to be effective. It's not the only way, it's just this kind of starting point and uh, what you need to do on your training flights is uh, try different methods and see what works best for you. But uh, here's an example of, um, of uh, somebody uh, scanning from the left rear window of the airplane. So he's, uh, he's back here in the airplane uh, looking out and you can see the diagonal scan pattern where he goes uh, like this and then he comes back goes like this, comes back like this, and then, uh, and then repeats the whole thing over there. They talk, uh, and these slides that need to be updated a little bit, they talk about uh, searching at 500 feet AGL. And in CAP, uh, we do not search any lower than 1,000 feet AGL. That's our, our minimum altitude for searching. Uh, we are uh, authorized to drop down to as low as 500 feet uh, if we want to confirm the sighting of some object, get a better uh, picture, a better view of it, or in the case of aerial photography, if we need to drop down that low to get a, a good picture, uh, we can do that. Uh, but other than those two momentary uh, dips below 1,000 feet, we're always at 1,000 feet uh, AGL above ground level. So uh, at 1,000 feet, like I said, kind of the going in spacing for your uh, scanning range, and here, here's, a, here's a better example of scanning range, uh, is uh, a half a nautical mile. So here's the aircraft track. I could, uh, this is the way the airplane's going over the ground, that's the track. And the scanning range uh, it also is an imaginary line that's parallel to your track uh, that is offset by a distance also called the scanning range. Uh, I wouldn't call these, these aren't the exact words I would use to name some of these uh, parameters, but that's what CAP has chosen to use, so that's what we're teaching. Uh, here they talked about the most experienced scanner will sit behind the pilot, uh, and that's because uh, the pilot isn't scanning. He's, he's working hard on keeping that airplane going right down that track and uh, flying accurately to put the scanners in a position to cover the, uh, the terrain uh, methodically. If the, if the pilot is all over the place uh, like this, then uh, the scanners are gonna be missing certain areas and we won't get the same coverage that we're looking for. Okay, so that's the uh, left rear. And then here's uh, from the right rear, uh, similar thing, diagonals, bigger field of view out here as you approach the scanning range. So you spend more time out there, less time uh, in close. Ideally, we'd fly, if we could, uh, pilot, a observer, a left scanner, and a right scanner. Uh, we normally don't have that luxury here. We're uh, personnel limited, and uh, I would say the majority of the time uh, we go out with a two-man crew. 
So, of course, the pilot will always be in the front left seat. Uh, the uh, scanner or observer, depending on who's available, will be in the front right seat. So that takes uh, some special uh, maneuver. We can't just go up one line, come down another line, go over like this, because we're only looking at one side of the airplane. So in fact, uh, what we do is uh, we go up one line, uh, we come down uh, the other line half mile away, uh, and then uh, we do a teardrop, a reversal, and go back up. So we get coverage uh, out the other side of the airplane and then continue like that. So one side is just a transition from uh, one line to another, and then the other one is um, a teardrop and back around again. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Okay, I've talked about repetition. I'm gonna repeat this again, uh, because I think you're gonna to need to know it very soon. Uh, scanning range, the maximum distance from a moving aircraft that a scanner can scan, and it's never greater than the search visibility. Search visibility is what I talked about, uh, the distance of which an object on the ground, and CAP kind of uses a car as a uh, fill-in for that, can be seen and recognized from a particular height. Now, if I was on a search for a missing person, then my search visibility would be, by definition, much smaller because it's much harder to see a person than it is a car. So search visibility uh, is a function of both the object that you're looking for and uh, the uh, atmospheric conditions. That's something that uh, Lieutenant Ng is going to talk about here. Yeah, three or four miles search visibility, that would be out in the open desert somewhere maybe. They talked about um, 80, 100 miles an hour. Uh, the typical speed that we fly when we're uh, uh, doing visual search is 80 knots. So uh, 80 knots uh, would be about uh, 92 miles an hour. Here we can see a practical application of, uh, of what we're talking about. Uh, so you can see on the left-hand side, these are uh, fists. It took me a while to figure out what these were. They figured out that the scanning range is going to be 30 degrees uh, below the horizon. There's the horizon. 30 degrees below it is three-fifths. And so for whatever reason, uh, they've decided that's what your uh, scanning range uh, would be. And again, your, your scanning range is always less than or equal to your uh, search visibility. So All right. Scanning technique. So why do we teach this? Well, because although we are not in the air ourselves, our SUAS is. And it is our eye in the sky. This is our future of mission scanning. We're looking forward to a new way of doing things. For that reason, we have to take all of those prior theories of scanning and put them into a new practice as we're monitoring our video or our pictures, whether that be during a live feed or after we process them and view them on the computer. So for example, Colonel Bomer uh, gave us an example during the, the, the searches of going up and doing a 360 rotation with the camera at, four, at 45 degree angle. And if you're doing that slow enough, that's going to be the same thing as doing that mission scanning. And if you really wanted to do it for, as a mission, like as a scanning technique, you would go a little bit, stop, go a little bit, stop. And those stops would be maybe for a second, second and a half, keep going, second and a half, keep going, second and a half, and there's your scanning. So you're using your SUAS to scan the ground for what you're seeing. By the same token, we are now, we are also scanning the skies. We're not looking down, we're looking up. Why are we scanning the skies? Why would a good technician, even though we're, I mean, we're, we, as pilots and technicians, why would we be scanning the sky? Avoiding. For hazards. 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 Bird strikes. Birds, right? Yeah. Um, Coming, Eagles. In, coming into play, not crashing into that apartment building that's right in front of us, uh, those kind of things. So, so those are the things that we're looking at. And so we still want to put that theory into practice, even though we're using the SUAS, 
instead of doing like he's saying instead of doing a creeping search go up bring your you could even do it with the camera go up and start your camera at 90 then bring it to you know bring it to 60 bring it to 30 now you've done a complete scan of that area spin it spin it uh uh you know yaw approximately uh 30 to 40 degrees do the same thing you're going to get you're going to still see everything that's in that uh, on that ground and you're going to get a bird's eye view does that make sense yes all right so we're going to have some fun now i hope and what we're going to do is we're going to use some scanning techniques while watching so uh, while while looking for things so we are on an suas mission team we've just come back and we're downloading our images it was really too bright out there and even with our sunshade we couldn't see the screen very well so we're giving them a second look on the computer so this first video is not taken with an suas but we still need to use the same techniques we just learned so here's the question for you how many dolphins are in the water Oh, they're mating. Mom, 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 Oh, this is a coastie. That's a coast guard? I don't know. A school. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely a pod of dolphins there. And really, we shouldn't have had the young lad with us. I'll, I'll just say that. Um, because there was a little bit of yeah. sex ed going on there. Uh, nature. <laughs> nature. So, I heard two. I heard four. Does anybody want to amend their number? What What do you think? I think I agree. With whoever said uh, the school, I believe there's a school there, sir, of dolphins or a lot of dolphins there. Was it three? Yeah, how many? Thought, it, how many? I thought three. I thought three. I'm going with two. Three. I'm going with three. Two. Three, I'm going with three. Four. Four. Three. I'm sticking with four as well, sir. Somebody's got sticking with four. All right. The answer is four. Yeah. From, from the 51 second mark for about half a second, you can actually see the four dorsal fins. And that's how quick something can happen. If you were distracted for that. Actually, sir, second, there are actually five. Nope. Because you missed one on the upper left corner. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's I didn't true. count that guy. <laughs> but there, yeah, I was more concerned with this one, but you're right. If we count that one, there's a fifth one. And I didn't see that, though. But, but I grabbed the concept. I grabbed the concept. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, so there you go. So mm -hmm. there, you, there's actually five if we count the, the, dor the dorsal fin back here, which we really do because I said how many are in the picture, right? How many, how many do dolphins are there there? There are actually five because we have this. So by using our scanning techniques, we see that fifth dolphin. So uh, awesome job, whoever caught that. I didn't even catch that. So that's great. Yeah, thank you, sir. That would be me, yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Lieutenant Koo, on the move. All right. <clears throat> okay, so here's our next one. This is an oblique that's taken with a tello about 30 feet off the ground, but it tells us a lot of information. In this whole picture, there's one person. Where are they? That was the first thing I saw. <laughs> right in the center, a little bit to the left, where that little uh, cart wrangler is. Yeah. Right there. So is that you raising your hand or like saying hello? Actually, no. That I, I just... Uh, that I just happened to have this picture taken. This was this is one of the first times when I put the tello up in the air, and uh, it, it was like, oh, I can use that picture. 
So I just popped it in. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you can imagine without this is this is the local grocery store uh, that I live right beside, and it's probably one of the busiest grocery stores. And I couldn't believe that there was only one person in the parking lot. <laughs> so, uh, the, just a, uh, I'm curious. I can't tell, but if you if that person circled, go all the way to the left. Oh, yep, there. Back, back, back to the right, right, right beside the big tree. Back to the right, 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 stop. Yeah, that's that, spec. Is that, that a person? I don't know. I can't tell. No, that is not. That's actually, that's, that's actually a fire a hide. cable box. <laughs> all right, all right. And I, like I said, I live right, I live right here. This is where I live. This is, this is my parking lot that I took the picture from. So my now the, the here, and that's the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, the reality is though, if you get much beyond the edge of that building, you're really not going to be. You, you, that's probably your your visual scanning range. Actually, that's about that's uh, like I said. This is a this is a picture taken at, at uh, thirty feet with a tele, which has a camera. The camera is mounted at at sixty degrees. It doesn't move. So if we use the tele. There you go. So at 30 feet, your scanning range is probably going to end right about here, right at right at the tip of the building. You, you so basically, that's what he's going much further. So that's what he's talking about for mission scanner. That's what the eye is going to look at. Exactly, and, and and that's what you're looking at with the with, when you're when you're doing your when you put your bird in the air, you're going to determine what the, what how far can you really see with your camera, right? When you have your ground station. And then when you take a look at your pictures, that's gonna either confirm or you're gonna have to reevaluate what the camera was really right. Doing. And then it takes discipline when you're scanning not to not to put your eyes up into that area where you really can't be effective. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So this is a not so good, I was still learning my stuff video. However, there is one part that's relevant to our lesson tonight. Okay. And I want you to keep an eye out. This is Fort Myers Beach, Florida. Notice how I spun that real fast. Like I said, I was still learning my stuff at this point. So did it fall in the water? Did your drone fall in the water? Nope. <laughs> Okay, because she wasn't over there long enough over the water then. Actually, I'm still on the I'm still over the ground, that's why. There's us. There's us right there. <laughs> what drone was this? Was this a this Mavic? was my this was my Phantom 3. Okay. Are you spinning the camera or the or the drone? I am yawing with the drone. Okay. Now I'm moving forward. But all that was was just I brought it up to about 110, 120 feet. And then I just started yawing in a 360. It looks like you were shooting this in sport mode, right? To be able to do it that fast? Uh, no. No, this is actually... See, now I've, I've brought the camera down. As I, as I said, it was just something I was playing with. And that's... Right now, I believe we're at about 50 feet. Okay. But... We've done what I wanted to see, and I should have cut the clip a lot more than that, but I'm just so proud of my work here. <laughs> so, we left, we left the car we're, door. When we were, <laughs> the car door when we were, open. Sorry, what was that? You left your car door open. Car door open on your the car. Car door's open. Yeah. Well, that's actually because there was somebody in the car door, and one of the, and, and there was one person that was sitting there. And with a little puppy too, and we didn't want the puppy to get too hot. 
and they did oh. and it was and it was really hot so they they were using the air conditioner in the car to keep cool but they still wanted to talk to us so they kept the door open <laughs> what's on the hood uh that's probably the bag for my launch pad yes. if you notice we were standing beside a launch pad all right so when we were looking out at the water and enjoying that beautiful view, anybody see the bird fly through the frame? No. 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 It's panning really fast. I was no. watching at the water. No, this is actually at a point where it was stable. I thought it was a shadow or something when you flicked it really quick. I thought that's what the result of that, when you yawed it really quickly, I thought that's what that was. But you said it was a bird? Uh, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna back her up, and I'm gonna show you where the bird is. And this is what I'm saying when uh, and and what Colonel Bomer is saying when we talk about how things can get um, can blend in, and even with the best of cameras on the brightest of days, we can see how things blend in. Okay, sir, I, I did see the bird come down a no, little no, bit. No, we're not there. Yeah, actually, no, not that bird yet. Oh, I'm just one. trying to, I'm just backing her up to get to a shot here. Gotcha. Now is where we stand still. And look at, there's the bird flying through. Oh, you believe it. Now imagine if that were a person walking. You'll be able to see it a little bit. I mean, that's obviously that's a bird. But if you were at three, if, and that's at 150 feet, what if we were at 400 feet and a it. person was wearing a tan shirt and walking? You wouldn't be able to see we, it. Would we be able to see him? And that's what we're talking about. So that when we use our scanning techniques, we're looking at every little piece of information that we can look at. And to be fair, and, the, zoom, the resolution fair on Zoom is poor. I, I give you a four minute clip and ask you for 10 seconds of where a bird, you know, near the beginning too. I realize that, that that's not a fair question. I'm bringing that up just to show you that sometimes if we may have a 10 minute video, there's the, see, there's my launch pad right there. Um, we may have a 10 minute video and we may miss something that so sometimes we may want to be watching a video two or three times using our, our, our techniques. Okay. So you can see how sca scanning that using our scanning patterns, even with a drone can help us locate targets. Yep. And again, one of those best ways to do it, as Colonel Bomo was saying, creeping line is great if you're doing an ortho mosaic, either the, court, the, the creeping line or the, um, uh, you know, the, the parallel pattern. That's great for a mosaic. What he's doing is the variation of, of a theme of doing that, that uh, three triangle thing, right? He's, he's literally put put things into a quadrant instead of instead of tri uh, triangulating he's put it into quadrants go up do a yaw and if you don't you don't and do it slow right and this is what like that as i said i think that was maybe the third time i had put the i had to put that uh that bird in the air i was still feeling the controls and so it was real uh, you know i've learned now that nice and slow and easy and you know you're not jerking it around but that's going to take practice and you'll notice you'll note that when you when uh, you start flying and it i'll be honest it really doesn't take long like it, that was maybe the third time up and so maybe after an hour and a half two hours you start getting a little bit more proficient with those type of things learning half sticks you don't everything doesn't have to be in a full stick um you know I find that youth know that right away. They're so good with, the, you know, with their little joysticks there. They know that they don't have to go all the way to the left, all the way. We're still at that point, you know. We, we, we played on, on Space Invaders and Galaga where everything was left and everything was right. And it was either all the way or nothing. 
<laughs> All right. Any questions on that? No, sir. All righty.